So, how did you feel when you got home? Because I know you said yesterday your brain was like shut down. No, I did not go. Knocked out. Knocked out. Cool. Did everybody feel the same way after yesterday's chapter? Yeah. I hate talking about taxes and <laughs> complications, implications. Okay. Right? Don't worry. It gets better today. Ready? Subdivision so and development. This is a really short chapter. Then we're going to jump into legal deeds and the legal description of deeds, and then we're going to jump into transfer of title. Tomorrow we have actually um, closings, so we're going to talk about title, recording, and actual closings. And then the next day, the following day, we have math. What? Excited? No. All right. Cool. So subdivision and development. Here we go. <clears throat> Developing and subdividing land. A developer may sometimes combine two or more lots into one larger parcel. And this is a process known as IKEA. Circle. Assemblage. Exactly. Assemblage. Because when you buy parts from IKEA, you have to assemble. I like IKEA. Oh, I didn't say anything against IKEA. You can buy wherever you want. You just know it's worth for that one ride, and that's it. <laughs> it lasts. No, no, true. Just don't move. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's what I said. It's good for that one ride. They will last as long as you don't touch them again. Like, right there. So no, nothing wrong with that. I buy a lot of stuff from Ikea. All right? In fact, some of the stuff here at the office came from Ikea. It's not intended to move to a new office. It will stay behind if we open another one. Anyway, the point of it is, you get two parcels of land, one right next to the other, right? So you own this one, now you purchase this one, and now you join them. So you get a survey, instead of having two lots, now you have one. It becomes a double lot, right? The moment you put them together, it's called assemblage, okay? When the resulting large tract is worth more than the total of the individual lots have been, the increase is known as plottage value. Now, right here at the bottom, going slow here. It says a subdivider buys undeveloped acreage. And we stop right here. Make sure you underline the way it is. And right underneath undeveloped acreage, you're going to write raw land. If it's undeveloped, then he has nothing, correct? So they buy the undeveloped acreage, and what do they do? They divide it into smaller lots for sale to individuals or developers or for the subdivider's own use. Now, a developer, who may also be the subdivider, builds homes or other buildings on the lots and sells them. So what do you need to remember here? Is that a subdivider buys big lots, cuts them into pieces. That's it. A developer builds on those pieces. Could the subdivider and developer be the one and the same? Absolutely. But they're playing, the per, that same person is playing different roles at different stages. Purchasing land, subdividing it, you are a subdivider. If now you build on it, now you are a developer. Okay? Two different roles. You got to remember this. Different roles. Subdivisions. It says in New Jersey, as soon as the second lot is sold off a larger parcel, the development is classified as a subdivision. I just want to show you something real quick of what I just said, because a lot of you get confused. I left your notes from yesterday. We have a big lot. Kevin, I'll get you in a second. We have a big lot that we purchase. We cut a slice. Is this a subdivision? No. This is the first lot. Now we just separate it into two lots. It's still not a subdivision. As soon as the second lot, now this second lot is what makes it a subdivision. 
as soon as the second lot is cut off and sold, it now creates a subdivision because it was once a whole thing. Now it's three parts. You guys got it? And from there on. So when is a class of subdivision? After the second lot is sold. After the second lot is sold. It says right here. Okay? After the second lot. Your question. Be, before somebody would actually buy, you know, the land, they would have to know if they would be able to subdivide it, correct? Yeah, and we're getting there in this whole chapter. But absolutely. Some of the stuff we're gonna just go right through it because we talked in chapter nine. Other stuff I'm gonna slow down. Good morning. Next page. It says, a minor subdivision consists of one or more lots. A minor subdivision cons consists of one or more lots that do not involve twins. You good? Okay. Like shaking everything, phone ringing, throwing chairs around. I want to make sure everybody at home knows <laughs> that Tiffany just got here. <laughs> no, buy everybody McDonald's tonight. Oh. I'm, I'm always down for food no matter what. <laughs> That's easy. Um, so if you're watching from home, you're missing out on McDonald's tonight. Who's playing McDonald's? I haven't had McDonald's. No, McDonald's was fine. I haven't had it in a while. If it's pizza, you got to order now, and I'll tell you the place to order. Best pizza ever. Oh, okay. Cool. Are you sure? Damn. You'll stop. <laughs> At the break, we'll talk about this. Because okay. they take a, a long time. They have so many orders, it's, it's ridiculous. Okay. They you know the to order. Yeah, they do deliver. They just take an hour to deliver. So you order now to eat at the end of the class. All right. So, major subdivision. What's the difference between the minor subdivision? Lucy's saying hi, by the way. Good evening. Uh, the difference between the minor subdivision and the major subdivision. Well, the major subdivision involves planned development, new streets, or an extension of off-track improvements. Now, each municipality, so when people come to me and say, Bruno, why doesn't this have a sign that says subdivision? Why doesn't it have a, a, something that says, hey, public hearing happening on this date? Well, every town has different rules to what is a minor and what is a major subdivision. What they constitute a major subdivision, right here, would require a hearing. A minor subdivision does not require a hearing. But again, you need to know the town rules for that. You got it? So, major subdivision, minor subdivisions, minor subdivisions, no hearing, major subdivisions, hearing. Who determines that? Municipality. Next, land planning. We talked about this in chapter 9. We talked about the master plan, correct? Correct. Great. What is the master plan? Who can tell me? Futuristic vision. Futuristic vision, like the Jetsons. Yeah, I guess it's just a plan of, just like you said, for the future development of the town or whatever. There you go. See, he might pass after all. I know. I hope so. <laughs> you got it. All right. Now, uh, basic municipal planning and zoning requirements are not inflexible, but long, expensive, frequently complicated hearings are usually required before alterations can be authorized. Next, it says communities established. We're just going through the highlighted stuff right now because this is the easy stuff we went over. Uh, communities established strict right here before approving new subdivisions, and the following are frequently included. We're going to talk about this in a little bit. Dedication for land of land for streets, schools, and parks. Assurance by bonding that sewer street costs will be paid. Compliance with zoning ordinances governing the use and lot size, along with fire and safety ordinances. Next, all this stuff we're going to go we either went over or going over it. So, local authorities usually require land planners to submit information on how they intend to satisfy sewage disposal, right, and water supply requirements. 
Because if you build 100 units, where's all that water going to? Not to mention something else, right? So one of the things that we need to do is development and or septic tank installation may first require a percolation test of the soil's absorption and drainage capacity. What is a percolation test? Not that. Uh, so percolation test is where we see how fast the water goes down into the groundwater. So if, if you're brewing coffee as an example, right, you put water on top and as the water goes through, that's the percolation test. Does that make sense? You guys got it? Great, so we have to test to see if it drains properly. Another thing we have to do is says, frequently a planner also has to submit an environmental impact report. Now who can tell me why would we have to have an environmental impact report? Because I guess at some point in time you want to revisit to see if And you, you want, want to, to know how? Go ahead, Trevor. No, you should. <laughs> oh, they're so kind to each other. What cousin? Um, that's what it was. I knew it. I knew it. I'm the cousin he was talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I knew it. He always said she. She, any man. He said he knew her. Mm -hmm. So it's um. A that's a great cousin. She says you're not gonna pass. It. Uh, <laughs> that's the real. That's one. That, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um. So the environmental impact report, obviously. Or I'm assuming it means the impact that it will have on the environment. That you assume correct, but why? <laughs> well, so you can know if something's going to happen. She said the same thing in the previous class. What? <laughs> Environmental impact report is how the environment's going to get impacted. Yes, but why? Down the road. Down the road, some people could know. But what kind of impact could happen? That's perfect. You got it right, but negative what? impact is looking for. Absolutely, but how? Kind of load. Can can the community? Yes, but why? I'm putting a hundred unit building. Um, how say it louder. Like soil and the uh, soil. Okay, why wanna, the soil? If you want to plant a garden, it might be you know messed up. How about planting and planting a building? Because yeah. planting a garden, what do you have to do? I I'm talking about how fast the, the. No, that was a percolation. That was like half an hour ago, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Did she bring you coffee and water? No, I, I got the okay. coffee today. Got, I'm, yeah. I was going so. to curse you out right now. Oh my god. <laughs> you were just right here. Mm. Not going to say anything. No, no. you're getting up anymore. Let me see if you guys understand one thing. At the end of the day, you got to give us a report. Thank you. Be Show nice up, to your yeah. instructor, be yeah. nice yeah. to your teacher. <laughs> I bring you coffee every day. But you were about to curse me. I was. You see what happened to Elle? She never came again. Yes. I've been here. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here for four times. <laughs> I don't know. What is going on? <laughs> That's it. I took care of her. Think about it this way. For you to plant something, what do you have to do? You're going to plant this. Dig. Louder? Dig. Dig. And when you're digging to plant something, in this case a building, what could happen? You could sink. That's one of the things. But the idea behind it is, as if you don't test the soil, right? So you set soil before and you're right on that. Before you dig, right? You need to know if there's chemicals or toxins inside or underneath the surface. You guys got it? Because as you dig, imagine there's oil. Not my fault. For some, are you okay there? Like you're I struggling know. with that. It, there's white stuff all over me. Like um, you do look a little pale. I know. So what was I saying? <laughs> it might have toxins and chemicals. Toxins and oil. chemicals. So when you dig, right? It could. You said it could be good. Yeah. If I have oil in my land, it's great. Right. But if you don't know what you're doing, and that oil spreads into another property, yeah. now you're contaminating somebody else's land, and you're responsible for the cleanup. We're going to talk about this as well. We already talked about it in, in chapter nine that who's responsible for the cleaning? You, you, and you. Right? So it's always back to you. If you got knowledge of it. Well, now, as of 1986, with the, the amendments, right? The Superfund Reauthorization Act, right? Now, we, we might be able to get away from it. But you went to dig without testing. 
Who's liable? You are. Mm -hmm. You guys got it? So the idea behind an impact report is I'm going to do this, test it to see how it could, this development could affect the community. Talk about that as well, right? You guys got it? Yeah. Next. Uh, under subdividing, I want you guys to highlight right here as and on the top as previously discussed. Close contact is initiated between divider, subdivider, and local planning and zoning officials. If the project requires uh, zoning variances, you guys remember variances? Mm -hmm. Say yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you know the rules. <laughs> Negotiations begin along these lines. Now, the subdivider also locates financial backers and is initiates marketing strategies. Uh, did we talk about purchasing the land yet? Land contracting? Did we talk about purchasing the land? No. I'm talking here about uh, design, architectural structures, engineers, all that stuff, right? Applying for variances, right? Mm -hmm. Going to City Hall and say, hey, here's all my stuff. If approved, let's move forward. So if approved, now I go for financial backers and marketing strategies. Do I have the property yet? No. Is it mine yet? No. We didn't talk about that, did we? Next, plans are prepared, approval sought from officials, permanent financing is obtained, and the land is? Purchase. After all this? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? We're just talking about that. We need to identify the land and figure out if we can do this. Right? Isn't that what you were saying before? Mm -hmm. This chapter is all about that. And so the developer will pay for all of this testing? Without having a property. Look at that. How much would that cost? Hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars, as I'll tell you in the next page. But the key thing here is, it's a catch-22. Let's say you buy the land, and then you don't get approved. Which one is worth, worse? Buying the land and not getting approved, or applying for stuff and not getting the land? Depends on how much the land costs. Exactly. It's a catch-22. Everything depends. So traditionally what happens is we'll put a like a lease with option to buy, or you said land contract, it could be. So the difference is the land contract locks you to something way bigger. Where a lease with option, right? I have the option. If it doesn't get approved, I was just renting it. Does that make sense? So you have to protect your interest somehow. You identify the property you want. You're gonna move forward to try to get the approvals, right? If approved, we buy it. We exercise the option. If not approved, hey, uh, Mr. Landlord, it was a pleasure dealing with you. Unfortunately, my project and I go through here. So, goodbye. Simple as that. Okay? You guys got it? Yeah. Next, subdivision plans. We also talked about this in uh, Chapter 9. And it says, in plotting out a subdivision according to local planning and zoning controls, a subdivider determines the size as well as the location of the individual lots. Size of the lots, front footage, depth, and square footage are generally regulated by local ordinances. Ordinances frequently regulate both the minimum and maximum lot sizes. Did we talk about this? Yeah. That we said that you'd be restricted? What She's on point with a yes. Uh, you'd be restricted. With the lot, with the four houses versus the Correct. Houses, yeah. Right? Whatever the subdivider determines. So there's the minimum required by the town. And as long as the subdivider complies with that minimum, the subdivider can now restrict that whole subdivision to a higher value than that. Does that make sense? So we said that two acres in, in chapter nine, that was the, the restriction, two acre versus the half acre lots allowed by the town. Okay. At the bottom. You see why I'm jumping, right? This is familiar stuff, so let's just move forward, right? At the bottom it says, in laying out a subdivision, a subdivider should provide for utility easements as well as easements for water and sewer mains. What is an easement? Formation to the... Oh. That's an easement, okay, it's easy to... That's a license. What you said, you right both of you. you Ooh, have, now we're better. You have a right to go inside our small Easement equals right. License equals permission. 
or privilege. Because a license can be revoked and the right cannot. So when we're laying out a subdivision, we give an easement, right, for the water and sewer mains. Who maintains the water and sewer mains? The city. Yeah. So the city has the right to go into, go into your property. You guys got it? Yep. Good. So water and sewer mains are usually laid in the street with connecting uh, junction boxes available for each building site. And when the city, town, or village installs the water and sewer mains that connect a new building with the junction boxes in the street, a tie-in or connection fee is frequently charged to help the authority defray the cost of the installation. It's very simple. These are the main pipes right here, the city pipes. And you decided to build something? Sure, we approve it. But when it comes to connecting to the town, somebody's going to have to come out and connect it. We don't do it. We hire a company to do it. So if we it? have to pay, yeah. If we have to pay for that company to come and install it, then you have to pay for that company to come and install it. Does that make sense? Because it's not my fault. You decided to do this. It only makes sense. Like the streets that are being fixed right now all over. Who does that? Is that your town? No. It goes for a public auction and people bid on the contract. Right? Wait, what? Let me wait, what? You talking about that, the, the things that are going on right now is because people bid on it? No, companies. So if you have a, a, a company that deals with water mains mm -hmm. or sewer or like the, the PSNG deals with electric, mm -hmm. right? Uh, some companies deal with construction, like we see a lot of creamer out there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what they do is they go on to the public work sites. So let's say the town puts a bid up for a project, for a job that needs to be done inside the town. They put a bid site and you go there and you put your bid, your proposal to the, to the job. So your company, if they win the bid, your company is the one that goes and do the work. Simple as that. See, the city has their workers to maintain, not to renovate. To renovate, they need expert um, companies to do it. One in 10 and one in, I don't know. Around they, here? The, oh, in my house, they did, Montana's the one that did yeah. the water main. In my area. Here it's uh, Fletcher, Kramer, or something like that? Yeah. And they didn't know how to fix the, the thing. It's bids, it's contracts, you're not listening. It's bids and contracts, you could win that bid. And the beauty of it is if you win the bid, you can subcontract to somebody else and get paid in between. So government jobs are great if you know how to do it. It's the best wholesaling ever. Because you don't lift a finger and somebody else doesn't work, all you did was the bid. Think about that. Anyway. You had a question, or are you just lifting the finger because I said you don't lift a finger? You're thinking if you have a question, she's like, hmm, should I? Because now I have an uncle. <laughs> oh, there you go. I knew it. What's your, what, sorry, good question. What's your background? Ecuadorian. Ecuadorian? Yeah. You were born here or? Born. Okay, so you're married. Yeah. But your family? Yeah. You're like first generation or second? First generation. Okay, so your family is Ecuadorian. Yeah. Got it. Um, Non-related, but uh, you're saying they that brought the whole Ecuador here. <laughs> like my family, my aunt, my uncle, my brother-in-law. That's right. Keep that's, family. Yeah, right. that's that's listen. That's the best way if you can work with the family. So who who approves like the the street? The city itself approves, but they hire contractors, or who, why would they improve like the street, for example? Potholes. Yeah, no, no, the potholes have been fixed several times. The problem is, because of how the, the things are coordinated, right? And we are alive, so I can say this, how the things are coordinated, meaning, hey, uh, Kevin, we'll fix some of the stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll leave some open for you in five years. So as long as you pay me, you're winning the bid. And you don't do the whole job now, We'll do something else later. Look, after that big hurricane, what was the name that had five days we had no electricity? Sandy. Sandy. If you guys remember, PSENG was fixing a bunch of stuff, right? Because we had no power, so there had to be some type of backup generators, right? So they redid a bunch of lines on an 83-mile 
radius, where it was most effective. 83 mile radius, okay? Here in Newark, just to give you an example, PSCNG was here for almost two months. You're telling me that they couldn't figure out the water problems that they're fixing now. You see what I'm trying to say? Everybody already knew that there was lead or too much lead in the water. Everybody already knew. It's like Flint. Everybody knew. But hey, let's delay this a little bit longer. Let's not do it now. It's not in the budget right now. You understand? So that's why potholes are like that. Because they're never fixed. If they fix, if they really fix things, like my country is a really small country, Portugal. Really, really tiny country. We rule the world, but that's back in, you know, a bunch of whatever years ago. Uh, really tiny country. But the roads are like butter. They're like butter. I mean, we don't have the same conditions, weather conditions we have here, right? And that's the biggest issue here. <sighs> All right, so let's go to different places. Right. Alaska. Go to Alaska and find me a road like the ones we have here. Because I was waiting for that. Go to Utah. Okay. Go to Salt Lake City. The, go there. The population is way less, though. So okay. I mean, less cars, less people. Less how about Salt Lake City? You got all the Mormons there? You know how it is? They way overpopulated. <laughs> but they don't drive, you know, half the time. Are you going to say that they're, they're like back in the day with no, camels and stuff? I'm, I'm, you, you're giving me that. No, I mean, I think that's the biggest, because I've lived in, in, in the South. The roads in the South, for the most part, are good because the, the potholes come around after the snow. When the potholes, nah, not really. We got a bunch of potholes right here, very close. We didn't have snow. They were just fixed a few months ago, and they're right back. We didn't have extreme weather conditions this, this uh, winter yet, right? We didn't have it. No snow. So what's the excuse now? And then the, the vehicles the that come through, government. you get a lot of big, heavy-duty vehicles that drive. Mm -hmm. All right. So there, there's a few places in the world that have both bridges and roads that haven't been redone in over 500 years. Let's talk about that. You see what I'm saying? I understand what you're trying to say. Mm -hmm. I understand what you're trying to say. And that's what I, the same excuses I was giving. Extreme weather conditions, the amount of traffic that we have. Some of these roads don't have trucks going through here in Newark. Most of them, yes. Some of them don't. Not them cycles. And they still and they still get a huge potholes, and they're still flood because apparently we can't fix flood. What, what like we have a whole pumping system in our sewer lines, right? But and water lines, but uh, yeah. That's Why do you think that, uh, the potholes come? From? What do you think caused? One is the material being used. Like, okay, and we gotta move forward, but very simple. Uh, New Jersey, just for Turnpike and Parkway, is considered to be charging over 40% more compared to other big cities. You go to New York, it costs you way less to fix the, the highways. Explain that to me. What's the difference between New Jersey and New York? As far as I know, there's way more traffic in New York. So now tell me. You see what I'm saying? It's what I was saying before. It's the government bidding. It's allowing people to continue to have a job. And because our amazing uh, political system, as long as you give me something under the table, we won't fix the whole thing. We'll approve yeah, it for later. That happens. Like that. Well, every country has it. But you want to know the, the, the real truth? That's the truth. Do everything out of hemp. I'll tell you right now that it will last way longer. They know that too. And they know that too. That's why it was forbidden years ago. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, that's a different story. You said hemp again. It was what? Make America hemp again. What is hemp anyway? I don't even know what is hemp. Okay. Um, Sorry. It's actually a plant. Okay. But it's stronger. All the like you can do cars out of hemp. You can do houses out of hemp. You can do clothes out of hemp. You can do whatever you want. It's the fastest growing plant. And if you don't take. Uh, some of the chemicals that it comes with, it's actually illegal drugs. Mostly known as? Kevin. Mr. Kevin? Oh, okay. Ashish. No. Ashish? <laughs> Cannabis Kevin. He knows about it. It's crazy. I didn't know that. Now you know. Yeah. 
So moving forward, because we got three ch chapters to go to the, over today, and I'm going to talk about laws and hemp and how it was forbidden a few years ago because, you know. No one did a table, actually. Oh, back then, yeah, it was about the iron being used. The railroads was more important, and railroads with hemp would be very cheap, so there's no money for the people that will gain from the railroads. <coughs> Rockefellers, <coughs> Rockefellers. Uh, so, <laughs> when a city, a town, we talked about this connection fee, right? Next, a large developer may also be charged impact fees. And right next, impact fees, right? I don't want you to write anything. We're going to write later. Intended to help the community. <laughs> Just want to see a few with me. Intended to help the community cope with increased demand for schools and other services. Next, most subdivisions are laid out by the use of lots and blocks. Nope, sorry. And at the bottom says street patterns. By varying street patterns and clustering housing units, a subdivider can dramatically increase the amount of open or recreational space in the development. And two possible patterns are the gridiron and curvilinear patterns. Curvilinear developments avoid the uniformity of the gridiron and are quieter and more secure. However, getting from place to place may be more challenging. I mean, let's look at it real quick. Gridiron is what most of us are used to, like down here. I know you guys have lines here, but this is the gridiron. This is the top view of your lots and blocks right here. Curvy linear, you get lost just looking at it. Think about it. Highly populated, easy crime area. I can steal a car and just run. Here, I get lost trying to run out of here. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. All right? And when I'm saying crime, obviously I'm not saying that every gridiron uh, design promotes crime. But if there's more population, what are the, the chances of higher crime levels? Does that make sense? So next we have clustering for open space. By slightly reducing lot sizes and clustering them around varying street patterns, a developer can house as many people in the same area as it could be done using traditional subdividing plans, but with substantially increased tracts of open space. For example, if we go down here to the subdivision styles, we have conventional gardens and we have cluster estates, mainly great iron. That's portable. Where? Here? You guys use that or that one? Which one is We're the guard, the real garden states of Europe. No, I'm, I'm no, because here in Jersey, like Jersey's called the garden state. I'm like, where? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Anyway. So you have conventional gardens, they have cluster estates. So gridiron, curvy linear. I know there's some curves there, but you see the way it's set up. Here's what I want to show you guys the difference between these two. Here, the lots are a little bit bigger. They're a little bit smaller. But you know what? A house is a house. So you don't need that much land. So we have the same, almost the same amount of housing units, 368, 366. Here's the big difference between one and the other. Under conventional gardens, 1.6 acres of parkland, Newark. Under cluster estates, 23 and a half acres of parkland everywhere else. Does that make sense? And look what happens with roads. Not that far off. So what we've done is by clustering everything, right, into small groups and these tiny uh, cul-de-sacs and curvilinear strategy, right, or patterns, we're able to still house almost the same amount of units, but with way better air with way better environment and quieter and more secure. Here's my question. Where would you like to live? Here or here? I'm going to go with the circles. So all of those You're are... going to go with the circles? Uh, yeah, I'm, going to go I'm going with the grid iron. Are all those circles... Um, Hi, do you go down that... Or each section in that circle with the properties? Do you see that? So right here? Yeah. This is the entrance. Yeah. going to come down this way. You get here, right here, cold as sack. That's your property. Also, oh, each one. This is your neighbor. This is the other neighbor. This is the other neighbor. 
That's an example. Uh, no. Imagine you traffic go nightmares with those, though. No. Yeah. How? Because there's so many because ways to get out. Right? No, it's not a lot of ways to get out. Look at it. Like, so if, say, everybody in that neighborhood right there goes no to work at life. 7 o'clock, at 7 o'clock, it's going to be traffic lined up all the way out. I'll tell you where the traffic's going to be. Somewhere around here getting to the main roads. Yeah. It's not going to be in here. But it's telling you, it's not going to be in here. It's here. While in this one, in Texas, look at the amount, like traffic all over. No, but you, you probably have like a million different ways to get out of the. I out know. Of, you can go down a street, then turn left, go this way. But with those, you're stuck. You only can go. It's, it's not bad. I'm yeah. just saying. I know what you're saying. You, you don't know. have a lot of people living around you. Like, he just ran away from Texas. That's what it was. He's like, I don't want, I don't want that life. Still, it's still nice, but that's the, that's the back, the part that you don't realize that it, it causes a lot of traffic when yeah. everybody leaves at the same time. But you, you don't have the same amount of people. In, in this scenario, it's very similar housing units. We don't have the same amount of people. And I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that not having the same amount of people and the way it's set up, what are the odds of everybody leaving at the same exact time? Right, one of the things, or coming back home at the same exact time, versus what you see here. And I'll tell you, here in Newark, when I lived here, I lived on Murray Street to get to uh, Wilson Avenue to drop off my kids in school. It's a five-minute drive, but not in the morning. In the morning, it took me almost half an hour from a five-minute, a six-minute drive. It took half an hour. Why? Because we all leave at the same time. And guess what? Even if I leave earlier, I cannot drop off my kids earlier. So they're stuck in the car for 10 minutes or 15 minutes just so I can get the prime spot to drop them off. Prime spot to drop them off means I'm the last one to get out because everybody else is now around me. Yeah. I've tried in all different ways. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Where in the other scenario, the, the cluster, right? Different type of school system, different type of environment, different type of everything. That's what I'm saying. Gridiron, it's where all, that's why it's called gridiron. <laughs> it's where all the traffic is. Well, everybody has a preference, so. No, no, exactly. So otherwise people wouldn't live here either, right? But I was just trying to show you guys, and uh, listen, I can do this by show of hands, right? Let's try this again. Sorry, where is it? Ran away from me. Right here. Just this one. I'm not even going to show the other one. Who would live here? I already know you. Okay. Who would live here? Both. All right. One hand up. They two hands up. They look similar. Kevin is like, oh, I don't know. Wait. Your your brother-in-law could live here too. <laughs> and your aunt. <laughs> and your cousin. I'm sorry. Roselle. Oh, Roselle is different. Yeah. So yeah, you could you could in this example you could use Roselle. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I just wanted to get like an image. So Kermit would be like Roselle, and then you would be like Roselle, right? Yeah, your house is right here. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense. Well, actually, no, you're not in the corner, so you're right there, right? Yeah, nobody wants to show. I'm just messing. I don't even know where your house. You get I know it's Roselle, but. You just live a little that house up, so it's like in the middle of all the houses. It doesn't show much, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's it. Just move the houses, rearrange, and you're good. Okay. Next. Plat of subdivision. Right above plat, I want you to write map. M A P. Like Dora the Explorer? Mapa? Do you guys know that one? Anybody? Not Spanish. Not in Spanish? Yeah. You know I in watched, Portuguese? I don't know. I watched it in Portuguese. It's still Mapa. Regardless. Anyway, so map. Plat is a map. Every time you see that word, map. So the subdivider's completed plat of subdivision. A map of the development indicating the location and boundaries of individual properties must contain all necessary approvals 
of public officials and it must be reported in the county where the land is located. So whatever you decided to develop, great, good for you. But it cannot exist unless the town approves. We already know this. Once the town approves, then your development is going to be integrated into the master plan. I was going to say that futuristic thing, but, <laughs> but into the master plan. Very important. Now that your development is part of the master plan, look right here. All areas that, are, that have been set aside for street purposes must be dedicated or turned over to the municipality. Dedicated or turned over to the municipality. What does that mean? Dedicated or turned over to the municipality. Yeah, Say it again. Sounds like it's not yours. You gotta give it to them to what you what you do. But why? You still didn't tell me why. It's not yours. Yeah, you're dedicating, giving up. It's not yours. It's different. Huh? I'm going to buy this huge parcel of land. Good so far? Mm -hmm. Yes. You're drawing? Katie's drawing. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, no, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. So now that you're drawing, here's what we're going to do. We're going to cut the land. you got to use the green as well. Into smaller lots. No, those are not teeth, in case you're wondering. Okay, so here's the thing. This right here was John's Road, where he bought the, the lot. This right here was Addison Road, for instance. And now, you bought that big lot, you cut it into pieces, but there's this space right here, right? This space, now we call it, um, I don't know. Oliver. What is it? Oliver. Why Oliver? We are. Don't tell people where we are. They don't know where we are. They don't know the address. He just wrote it down, right? Eh? <laughs> it's a commercial. It's a commercial. If you're watching from home, we're at 18 Oliver Street in Newark, New Jersey on the third floor. March 9th, next night class. All right, anyway, zip code 07102, but it uh, doesn't matter right now. So we just created Oliver Street. The question is, why does Oliver Street, right, remember, this used to be ours because we bought the whole lot. But now we put the Oliver Street as an axis from Sean's Road, right? And as an axis from Madison Road. Why is Oliver Street's turnover given or dedicated to the municipality? Because now it's part of the, the town. It's a public plan of map. It's a public road. It became a public road. Just because it's part of the master plan doesn't mean it's a public road. With the map and all that stuff. Doesn't mean it is. And the city or the town is going to probably maintain the street. The city is now responsible for maintaining it. You called it easement. You said easement? Not in this case. It was really just given to the town. An easement is the property is yours and somebody else has the right to your property. Here, you completely gave up this section. Oh. This is not yours anymore. Really? Yeah, that's what dedicated, given, or turned over to the municipality means. Put a gate, like you want to Aha, you're getting somewhere. If, put a gate, if your intention is to make this a gated community, then uh, these streets are private. 
You guys got it? The street is private. Who maintains the street? Yeah. The people are in the community. HOA. The HOA. You guys got it? HOA? Homeowners Association. Oh, yeah. You guys got it? If the intention, that's what it says here, if it is not the subdivider's intention to dedicate the, the property to the municipality, then the the plat or the map should specify that the streets are private. Very good. It's like the ones that you have over there, where you have a property? Because mm -hmm. then they have gates, right? So it's considered... Yeah, gates that never close, but yeah, it's a... Uh, they don't work. They haven't worked for a while. Uh, <laughs> But it is a private community, All right? So that's the difference. If you don't intend to keep it private, then the streets must be turned over or given to the municipality. Oliver Street now belongs to the city of Newark in this example, right? If you intend to keep it private, then Oliver Street belongs to Oliver Condos Association. Simple. So all the owners in this particular municipality pay the HOA fees in order to maintain that road, to fix, to clean, take the garbage out, all that stuff. You guys got it? Or do you think these roads were made by the town? The roads that we travel, whether it's main or side streets? No. Some developer came, purchased the whole thing, cut it to smaller lots, sold these as two families, right? All of these two families sold them individually and let the city maintain the property. Simple as that. Any questions? No. No? Great. Did you finish your drawing? Does it have teeth? <laughs> cool effects. I just pressed the wrong button. <laughs> All right. Uh, covenants and restrictions, we talked about that in chapter nine and where it says fha standards just please highlight all it says if, is that if that development is being placed in an area where you intend to obtain fha insurance for those for loans then it needs to fall under fha guidelines for uh as far as the building uh guidelines so right here next page it says the fha standards are also applicable to the building construction and because the FHA is under the Housing and Urban Development, that tells you that everything in the FHA is controlled by the government. So all the developments within HUD-controlled areas, right, must be FHA approved and so on. Next, development costs. Kevin. The subdivided developer or builder and builder frequently invest many hundreds of thousands or in larger developments, there are millions of dollars before what? The subdivision is even announced to the public. You got it? Based on what we've been going through, you'll understand that. The plans, variances, uh, getting uh, marketing done, financial backers, right? People that will fund the deal, all that, engineers, architects, right? All that takes into play before we even purchase. So only after we purchase is when we really start announcing to the public. What I want you to go to on top is that in certain areas, a subdivider may be required to give financial assistance to school districts, park districts, and the like, either in the form of donated school or park sites, or in the form of a fixed subsidy per subdivision lot. What I want you to write, now you can write, Impact fees. Remember them from the previous page? Impact fees. Why impact? Because, look, let's talk about Newark. The schools are already jam packed, right? There's too many kids for the schools we have. Now imagine we just got a 100 unit apartment building approved right here. Now, if you guys. I'm getting there, easy. I'm gonna give me like, end, attitude. <laughs> uh, so, but if it's 100 units, then most likely it's gonna house 100 families. There might be one or two people that are single, right? But we're looking at 
most likely 100 families. And a national average of 2.43 kids per family, so it's a little bit more than two, but we're not gonna slice kids, so I'll make it easy. Let's go with two, right? I'm the one disrupting the average because I have four. So I'm like, eh. let me change this average, it's easy. Anyway, um, it's gonna be a basketball team one day. Maybe soccer, I don't know, or football. We'll figure it out one day. Uh, but the point is, at least two kids per unit. So if it's a hundred unit apartment building, how many kids we have? 200. 200. If you got 200 kids, do you think maybe we need a new school? Or can we fit these kids in the current schools that we have? You see what I'm saying? So that's why your development might be charged with impact fees because you're forcing the municipality to now get another school. You guys got it? I'm sorry? Huh? Did you understand now or you want to a little bit more? <laughs> All right, cool. Next, subdivision density. All right, cool. Subdivision density says zoning ordinances often include minimum lot sizes and population density requirements for subdivisions and land developments. For example, typical zoning restriction may set a minimum lot area in which the subdivider can build a single family housing unit at 10,000 square feet. This means that given the ideal land conditions, the subdivider is able to build a maximum of four houses per acre. You guys agree with that? Huh? Four houses per acre? Yeah. Right? It's a lot of space, right? Do you guys agree? If I have one house per every 10, thousand square feet that means I can build four houses per acre. Do you guys agree or no? Did we go over that? Mm -hmm. that no. Oh. That's why I was asking if you guys agree. This is the point where you say yes or you say no. You, you're allowed to say no. 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 Why not? Go okay. So oh, she did. She ten thousand is less than a quarter acre. I know it's not a quarter acre, it's one acre. All right, but you said you could build four houses on an acre, so each house would be a quarter of an acre, right? Maybe. How much is a quarter of an acre? I think it's like, uh, it's more than 10,000. What is an acre? How about if I ask how much is an acre first? Yeah. Uh, I don't right. know. Don't worry, simple system to remember. You guys ready? Yes. You're smiling. Do you have the, the, the answer for this? The first page. Oh, you looked at the first page. So in the state exam, you cannot look at the first page of your book. I'm just letting you know. You got to know how much one acre is. You guys ready? Yeah. So one acre. Remember that for now. One acre. Now there's a story behind this. It's a really cool story, by the way. Yeah, you guys ever seen the movie Alvin and the Chipmunks? Now the movie cartoons? Yeah, Great. So Alvin Chipmunks, did they ever drive a car? In one of the back of the room. Remember down, driving down the Yeah, but something right here. So we don't have chipmunks. So in, in this class, we play with squirrels. Because we're trying to figure out square feet, right? So SQ for squirrels, right? And they're driving in an acorn. Acorn car, one acre car, right? So these are four squirrels. And here's the thing. These four squirrels are going down Route 35, right? So they're going down Route 35 down to the beach, right? And they're going at 60 miles an hour. See, here's the thing. They have to be cautious. Because if the cops catch them, imagine the squirrels driving, it's a problem. So as they're going heading down to the beach, under the speed limit. Four squirrels down Route 35 at 60 miles an hour. And that's how much an acre is. It's 43,560 square feet. You guys got it? Everybody's just like, what? <laughs> Malik is like, oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to remember the test. I always tell this story because this was a student of mine that, that taught it to me. 
right, almost four years ago, she taught it to me. She says, you know, Bruno, my daughter learned this way in school. And she tells me the story. The four squirrels, Route 35, six miles an hour. Of course, I've developed a little bit more from that. But she never said going down to the beach, right, under the speed limit. But for me, I started picturing already a bunch of stuff, like the Geico commercial with the pig. Whee! <laughs> Driving the car, right? Remember that? Yeah. So that's what I started picturing and created a story around it, okay? But I know, Malik, that's still stupid. But here's the thing. <laughs> there was one person in the class that day when she told me that story that sat right here in the front in that particular class. She was sitting all the way back where, where Kevin is. There was like 50 people. And this guy in the front goes, that's stupid. Just like you did, yeah. So... <laughs> Here's what happened. In a couple chapters, we're going to be in the math chapter. And I asked the question. One of the questions there is about an acre. And I asked the question, how much is an acre? Guess who answered out of all of them? I didn't even say anything. Well, how much is an acre? He goes right away. <laughs> Four squirrels, Route 35, 60 miles an hour. I'm like, oh, not that stupid, huh? <laughs> It's almost like the 1-800 car for kids. It's like the, that jingle gets stuck. So how much is an acre? He refuses. 43.560, he says. <laughs> I refuse to talk about squirrels. <laughs> it's ridiculous. In the car. Driving. <laughs> to the beach, nonetheless. Squirrels at the beach, really. They have towels, though. <laughs> right. So now... It said there that you can build one house for every 10,000 square feet, right? So if it's one house for every 10,000 square feet, one acre, right, divided by 10,000 equals four houses, 0.356. So how many houses can you build? It says right there, maximum of four houses per acre. And if you guys, if we're doing the same thing that we saw before, right? Let's do this. Ah, that's not what I wanted. Right? One, two, three, four. It looks like the key. Yeah, it's the key. My point was, my point was, like we did before, the cul-de-sacs, the cluster, right? Because we're going to talk about that right now. It says right here that many zoning authorities now est establish special density zoning standards for certain subdivisions. Density zoning ordinances restrict the average maximum number of houses per acre that may be built within a particular subdivision. If the area is density zone at an average maximum of four houses per acre, for, instance, for example, the developer is free to achieve an open effect by clustering building lots. You guys remember cluster estates? You had different cul-de-sacs, different blocks, right? As long as the average maximum per acre, doesn't matter where, which shape it was, and if you saw that before, right? As long as they're an average maximum of four houses per acre, right? They're meeting, me, meeting that minimum, or the, the maximum in this case. So it says, regardless of the lot size or the number of units, the subdivider is consistent with the ordinance as long as the average maximum units in the development remains at or below the maximum density. This is called a gross density. What is density? How much? How much you have. If it's too dense or if it's too scarce, then that's density. There's too many in one place or there's not enough in one place. You guys got it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, at the bottom. I didn't give you a break yet. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> you can go. <laughs> she looks back. <laughs> all right, next. We talked about environmental protection, so let's go all the way to the bottom. It says the highlands. The Highlands Water Protection and Planning Act provides New Jersey's, uh, protects New Jersey's drinking water. 
And we talked about this in, in chapter 9. Developments involving one acre or more, or paving over or cover, covering of a quarter acre or more, are regulated in the Highland area by the Department of Environmental Protection. The supervision is intended to protect steep slopes, upland forests, and areas around open waters. Something you need to know is that the New Jersey Pine Lands Protection Act regulates 22% of the state's land area, and the Pineland National Reserve, known as Pine Barrens, consists of oak pine forests, extensive wetlands, and historic villages and berry farms. Why do I have this in green? Because they are protected. <laughs> because it's on the city exactly. Because it's pro they are protected. In fact, it says human activities must respect the natural and cultural resources. Malik's still thinking about the squirrels. <laughs> His home is about to laugh, Lynn. <laughs> You're not picturing the squirrels here, right? You're in the pine barrens. Now that's more like it, not at the beach. <laughs> All right. New Jersey uh, Department of Environmental Protection, or DEP, regulates developments in marshes and other wetlands under the Wetlands Act of 1970, as we said in Chapter 9. And because it protects everything that happens by the water, it also says that before you can do anything by the water, you have to apply for a permit. Okay, so the DEP requires a permit before you can do anything. Again, this was in Chapter 9. Just put a, a box around this. We talked about in Chapter 1. If it says interstate, we're talking about out-of-state. Out Very good. And you guys know that if it's out-of-state property, you must be registered with a bureau. In fact, one of the, the reasons why it has to be registered with a bureau is because it has to provide at least seven business days free to cancel a contract. And also, you have to present your prospectus. That goes with a statement of record. What is a prospectus? It shows where you intend to do, including your marketing. And if your marketing is in a language other than English, do you guys remember this? Mm -hmm. Subsequent forms of advertisement must continue in that same language. You remember? I remember. Okay. I told you I keep on going back and forth. Next, this was part of chapter seven. We talked about it uh, briefly at least this part that I'm about to read, and now in detail. It says, for certain subdivisions within the state, primarily those that involve common elements, most condos, co-ops, and planned unit developments, next page, and for subdivisions with more than 100 lots or with a homeowner association, the Planned Real Estate Development Act sets requirements similar to those in the Real Estate Sales Full Disclosure Act discussed in chapter one same as the interstate property the disclosure statements must be approved and registered with the bureau and the prospectus furnished to potential buyers so it's not only out-of-state property if it's large developments they fall under the same categories okay so if a New Jersey subdivision falls within the requirements of the act then the buyer again has the right to cancel a contract in this case within seven business days. Next, building regulations. <clears throat> There's a uniform construction code. Uniform construction code. Now yesterday we talked about UCC as well, but it was the uniform commercial code. Why they came up with the same name, I have no idea. UCC, UCC. I don't know. But here's what you need to remember. Under construction, who regulates construction? The commissioner of the Department of Community Affairs regulates construction, alteration, renovation, occupancy, and use of all buildings. Please underline all that. You guys know what manufacturer's warranty is, right? Yes. Okay, because we're going to talk about it in the chapter. Manufacturer's warranty. Well, if there's a new house that's being built, right, then it's like a manufacturer, correct? Yes. 
it should come with a warranty that the structure is solid, that nothing is going to happen. Correct? So every new home must come with a warranty. It's called the Warranty Builds Registration Act. All builders of new homes must register a warranty against new home defects for various periods of up to 10 years. With who? Department. Department of Community Affairs, just like we said above. Okay? Here's what you need to remember. Underline this. Up to 10 years. Yes, it must. Mandatory. You could get sued. I hope. If anything happens, you could get sued personally. By who? If your house starts sinking, right? As you, as you, your house could sink, right? If it starts sinking, then somebody needs to fix the problem. Who's going to fix the problem? Hopefully, the builder is still, still around, right? But if it's sinking too many houses, he might not be around. He might be in the Cayman Islands. Cayman Islands. not going to be around. <laughs> Somebody's going to take care of it. Is it cousin. normal? If it's normal for the cousin to take care of these problems, yeah, it's not. I'm the cousin. <laughs> oh, I can tell. What's normal? For houses to sink? It's not a normal, normal thing, like, you know, you're safe, your house should not be sinking. But there, every land moves. So there is a, a slight possibility that your house has been sinking for the past hundred years. We just don't notice. Huh? Settling. It could be settling. Right? It's a tiny adjustment here and there. So you don't even feel it. But do houses sink? Yes. My dad was living at a house in the hillside, brand new. And one day he looks at the ceiling, and the ceiling is like at an angle. You're like, this doesn't make any sense. Was it always here? And they realized that something in the foundation was off. So it did start go down in the middle. And the, the guy that built it had to fix it. Now imagine having to lift a house and fix the problem. How did, I mean, how did you do that? It happened. Listen, Remember that you house? have to dig, go all the way down, put supports, uh, rebuild the foundation without wow. damaging the actual structure. Remember that house that was Steve? The house was in the middle, there was the outside, there was the grass. Oh, yeah. And the water comes on the sides, and as soon as we walk inside of the house, Bruno went like, "Wait!" And then everybody was just like going down, kind of. It was slanted on the of the half of the side of the house on the left side. You're like, slanted. You get dizzy. Yeah. That's how bad it was. My buyers were like, "Whoa!" <laughs> I was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> and this is no. just going up the stairs to the kitchen. Yeah. When we got downstairs, it was literally the floor was like this. So, nope, not buying. The price was right, though. The price was right. It was like $50,000 less. That's than the, yeah. All right. And when it's it like floats on. Yeah, that's maybe a horse. All right. On the right-hand side on top. <clears throat> You guys already know that if you um, want to do something with your property, right, Tiffany? Right, Tiffany? What are you talking about? This is the time you say yes. Yes. Okay, great. You don't finish basements, people. <laughs> Unless you're Tiffany. Listen. <laughs> Unless you. I didn't say that. I just said that I forget, but I don't forget. <laughs> don't feed information. Here's the thing. Before you do any construction, it's in green, meaning it's important. Any construction, alteration, demolition, or change of use in the building can be undertaken. You have to apply for this construction permit. Okay? Oh, man. A local official, look, 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 gets better. It says a local official must then inspect the application and the property to determine whether it conforms to the requirements of the code. Within 20 days, this official gives you either a okay or a nay. Not going to happen. Right? If you get rejected, what can you do? Appeal. Everybody's like, the first thing they say is appeal. If you get rejected, it's appeal. How about correcting the problem first? Yes. Everybody's like, no, 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 no. Mr. Inspector, you're wrong. 
I'm appealing this case. How about just correcting? <laughs> no fights, man. Uh -huh. I was talking to somebody in South Jersey the other day, and he goes like, hey, out here, back home. I'm like, what? Back home? You're, I'm like, what is that? Oh no, I got it, I got it. That's what I told him, I got it. Like, I'm glad you did. Like, was that a threat? <laughs> I felt intimidated. So five minutes later, guess what my conversation was? Every time he said something that was not to my liking, <laughs> hey, back home. <laughs> Digging a hole and people just disappear. <laughs> That's what the back home does, makes holes. <laughs> Anyway, so if rejected, she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> why do you think they never found the inspector for her basement? <laughs> uh, anyway, so the first thing you do is try to correct the problem. Unless you're 100% sure, right, that the way your plans are should be approved, then you appeal. Simple. So if rejected, you may revise. That's the first option to revise the plans to meet the requirements, or as an alternative, you appeal. Simple. Once everything is a okay, CO. that that basement is in the proper conditions, proper. you get a CO, certificate of occupancy, that says, "Hey, it's okay to occupy." Uh -huh. So uh, many municipalities—that's where you get your twelve hundred a month from. Many municipalities. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's the first one. The basement is too. Uh, many municipalities now require a certificate of occupancy for transfer of title. Now, here's something you need to remember. Not all municipalities require a CO at closing. Meaning, you might be able to close without a CO. Meaning, you might be able to close faster because that's not a requirement. The inspection is not a requirement. Yes. A little for north, right? CO. But if they gave you a seal with a basement, bathroom, everything finished, are you blue? What do you How doing? much you pay them? I mean, uh, what, sorry. Uh, <laughs> did you buy the house like that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so then so, what? What do you do? Okay, last. You know how it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. If the seal was a t was was was. If you have proof, Water. because you might be, see, here's what happened to a friend of mine in Elizabeth. They tried to, somebody complained about the basement, right? Because that's how it is, your neighbors, right? Somebody complained about the basement. So the city inspector came out. It's a different city inspector or building inspector than it was when the guy purchased the house. Here's what happens. They wanted to find him, tell him that he has to take walls out. He has to take the, the stove. He has to take the cabinets. He has to take everything. They're forcing this guy to do all this stuff. He says, no. When I bought it, it was already like this, and I received the CO from the town. Right? They didn't care, so he had to get an attorney and go to court. What he had to do was present the listing that was done before. He bought the house. And then the listing already showed in the pictures, and that listing already showed the basement as is. He did not do anything. So between the proof of what it was, plus a CO from the town, Your Honor, this was already done. Whether it's up to code or not, it should be grandfathered in because I got approved. I shouldn't be liable for those things. And that's what he had to do. He won the case by presenting what was before, what it is now, and they look the same. You got it? So if you bought the house already with a finished basement, finished everything, Right? Not like, not like I know. Uh, what do you do? Keep records. Because otherwise, City of Newark, $3,500 per day that the violation continues. So I guess if you remove those things and redo it, it's different ball again. Remove those things, what do you mean? Like take down walls, or like remodel. Did you get a CO? No. Did you get a building permit? Yeah, does it look similar to what it was before? Well, it's not the next right now. I'm going to be working on it. How was it approved? How did before? It 
It did. No, no, what I'm saying, how was it approved? How's your new structure going to be? The layout is going to change? No, I would do it the same way. Yeah. Okay. Same, same All right. Layout. Is there any electrical or plumbing involved? No, not really. Because everything's still there. Because you're removing walls. Yeah. Is there any electrical or plumbing involved? Yeah. Okay. Yes. You need permits. Here's the other question. Are any of those walls that you're about to touch a potential retaining wall? No. Where the building might collapse if you touch that wall. That's things that people don't know and go like, hey, open concept. Oh. Yeah, open. <laughs> no. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you need to know this stuff. If there's electrical or plumbing involved, true stories. Uh, well, I imagine you just, well, you know, just try to have it. True, true plumbing stories. Down. Well, nice. Add it to the, to the Okay, if you're replacing a toilet, in most municipalities, replacing a toilet is a major plumbing issue. Therefore, permit required. I'm not. That's why I need to know your codes in your town. Okay. All right, next. Don't even. Yeah, don't say anything, just do it and hey, surprise. No, no, don't do it. They will Girl? All right. Uh, Many municipalities now require a certificate of occupancy for a transfer of title or change of tenants. All one family and two family homes must be inspected for the presence of smoke detectors prior to the transfer of title or change of occupancy. This was chapter 9 as well. Existing buildings, they get what's called a certificate of continued occupancy. Again, if it exists, then there's no, no alterations. You get a CCC, you don't get a CCO. I mean, you don't get a CO. You get a CCC or a CCO, that's what it is. Oh, 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 right, look at that. Safety requirements, it says, in New Jersey, a change of occupancy for any one family or two family dwelling requires that the building have smoke detectors on each level of the dwelling and within 10 feet of every sleeping quarter, okay? Each municipality, check this out, each municipality has the right to require more than this minimum. So this is the state. But each municipality has their own rules. Some municipalities, believe it or not, Newark, requires hardwired detectors with battery backups. So if it's a new, you don't have to change the old ones, but if it's a new construction, right, or remodeling of an existing structure, you have to have uh, hardwired Detectors with battery backups. It depends. Depends if it's, a, if it's a commercial building. If it's um, one or two family, they don't, they don't request. And uh, if it's a, a three family or more, depending on the structure. If there's no fire escape, you got to have it. Oh, okay. So there's a lot of depends here. Yeah. There's a lot of depends here. Because <laughs> there's a lot of places that don't have uh, fire escape the way they were built. So if you're renovating, you might be required to put some stuff. Now the state also requires at least one properly installed carbon monoxide detector and an approved fire extinguisher. Uh, hotel and multiple uh, dwelling health and safety law. If you guys notice, we talked about one or two family. Did we talk about three or more? No, but three or more falls under the hotel and multiple dwelling health and safety law. So anything that's three or more, again, falls into these requirements. What you need to remember from here is that multiple dwellings are inspected at least once every five years and hotels at least once every three years. I wouldn't be too concerned or dwell too much into this if you're just being a salesperson for now. If this was a broker's course, I'll go more in detail into this portion. Right now, just know three families or more same category as a hotel or multiple dwelling and has to be inspected. You have to get a green card for your three family or more. Green card, that means that they pass the requirements. Inspected every five years, okay? Yes, Kevin. Do you have to get the every five years or just say- You heard green card, in. it goes like, hmm, that's me, go. Or do you have, or do you say it just comes in like after the five years? Say it again? The say it just comes into the property like you yourself- They can come in at any time. They don't even have to, to give you notice. Yeah. You got it? You guys good? Yes. All right, that's all I need to remember. The next thing you need to remember is? 
Pizza. Pizza. Can you help out? Yes. All right, whoever's watching from home, we're going to be back in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Pizza, pizza.